Well, good morning, church. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen, amen. Y'all bear with me. I've got a little bit of a, a tickle in my throat, but we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So if I have to hawk and spit all through this message, I, I will get through it in Jesus' name. I just feel bad for the front row, okay? And real quick, I promised I'd do a shout out. It's Miss Cindy's birthday. Where, where did Miss Cindy go? She. Well, all right. Happy birthday, Cindy. <laughs> that wasn't awkward at all. All right, so I'm, uh, I'm fit to be tied this morning because I've gone about a month without getting to preach to you guys, and that's hard on me. But no, it's been wonderful. We've had the special pastor's appreciation. We've had some wonderful Sundays, and didn't Pastor Daryl do a fantastic series on grace and seated in heavenly places? And him and Julie and a few of our elders and their families are in Mexico this morning celebrating uh, Julie's birthday. So this is all going out in Spanish right now. And uh, we love our senior pastors. If you get online, show them some love. And I hope that they're having a wonderful time. So jumping right in, preaching is a really interesting dynamic. Some of you in this room, you, you've stood up and you've preached in church. Or, or how many of you... You've ever had to get up and give a speech at a wedding or a funeral, okay? <clears throat> Nobody. Okay, so great. It's an interesting dynamic because there's so much that is going on. Now, I've been blessed in my life. A lot of people are terrified of public speaking. I have never felt that fear in my life. In fact, I get more nervous having to wait until I get up here because I can't wait to get up here because I know the one that has the answer to all of your problems and his name is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so before any time I preach, I feel like somebody who's playing poker and they've got the hand that no one can beat. But you have to wait. You have to be patient. and You have to put on the poker face. Now one of the things that you guys should know about me is my face hides nothing. <clears throat> So if you ever need me to sneak you into a country or get you through airport security, this face is going to fail the test every time, you know. Sorry, is this really your passport? It's the eyes. I'm not good at lying. But I know that a lot of people, like public speaking, it, it can be scary. But the interesting dynamic about any time you do public speaking or preaching is... You know, I'm trying to get people to not check out. I'm trying to get out what's in my mind. If you guys think that I'm a decent preacher, you ought to hear the voice in my head. He's fantastic. <clears throat> I can't even preach 10% of what this guy wants to preach because I'm just all over the place. I try to make sense of my points. I try to not put you to sleep. I try to get you to laugh or smile, and I'm trying to have an impact on the one person that needs a touch from God in here. Do you know that we serve a God that loves you enough that he will, send, he will make an entire message sent by a weird man to touch you so that you do not leave here the same way that you came in. That's how much he loves you. But I'm also trying to get you to be honest with yourself. You know, Christians are some of the hardest people to get them to be honest with themselves. We wear many masks when we come into the church, you know, instead of, see, where the church has missed it, we come in here like this is a museum for perfect people. It's supposed to be a hospital for hurting people. But see, we put on these masks and, you know, how's your family? Fine. How's, how's this? Fine. How's this? But only you know what's really going on in here. You know, the funny thing about Christians is I'm constantly trying to get you to look in the mirror and say, is this message for me this morning? Because I know, I know you guys are holy. You've never had these thoughts like I have. How many of you have ever heard a message and you said, Boy, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this message. <laughs> Boy, that message would be for so-and-so if they were just here. Now, you know what? One time, Daryl was preaching a really awesome message and he, he was really getting deep with it. And I remember just thinking, Boy, so-and-so needs to hear this. And immediately I felt the Holy Spirit say, No, you need to hear this. See, if we can be honest with ourselves, we might just get that touch from God that we've been begging Him for during the week. See, we hear messages and we say, yeah, I get them. Or, or, you know, my favorite is when people come to you and say, man, that's the best message I've ever heard, and then they don't put it into practice in their life. Oh, that's for someone else. This morning, if you'll give me 20 minutes, I know, 
20 minutes is a lot in today's culture, all right? Give me, give me two minutes. If you'll give me 20 minutes and you'll be willing to be honest with yourself, I think Jesus wants to really move and set some people free from things that they feel like they can never be free from this morning. Now, with that said, how many of you in this room, raise your hand, are outdoorsy kind of people? You like hiking. You like camping. You like rock climbing. You like spelunking. And you like caving. We live in a very blessed area. We have a pretty cool cave, a landmark. It's called the Lost Sea. It's up around Sweetwater, Tennessee. If you've never been, it's really cool. You go way beneath the Earth's surface. The, uh, the temperature is always the same year-round down there. doesn't matter if it's snowing or 100 degrees. It's got like a pond, the Lost Sea. And so it's, it's really interesting. I'm not a big caving guy. Dark, damp, bat-infested places I don't think are for humans. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> and every time I've ever gone caving with my friends, they're like, oh, this is just wonderful in God's glory. And I'm looking around like I see a million ways to get stuck or die <clears throat> in this cave. And then they want you to squeeze. They're like, oh, we're going to have a great time, boys and girls. You're going to squeeze into these crevices, and you may get stuck just for a minute. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. And I'm like, why would I want to even attempt this? And one of them was called the birth canal. And you go down in this little thing, and you weasel your way out, and you come out like this. And I was sitting there thinking, I went through the birth canal once. I'm good. I'm not. I'm good. I did that experience. It was fine. I'm here. I breathed. I lived. <clears throat> I don't want any part of that. So one night we spent the night uh, in the Lost Sea, John Knox and, and several of the kids, and it was, it was so eerie to me because what was weird is there was no noise, no outside noise. You couldn't hear the trucks going down the road. You could just hear the water dripping and the bats saying, I can't wait to bite him later, you know. <clears throat> Y'all pray for me. It was so quiet. It was so dark. It was so damp. It was hard to sleep, but it was, it was really interesting. And I remember in this moment thinking, I could not imagine living my life in a cave like this. There's a story in the Bible where a certain type of people did live in a cave. And what I want to bring out this morning is I believe that there may be some people in this room, you've gone back to the caves or you've still been living in the caves that Jesus has been trying to pull you out of for a long time and you're thinking there's no way I can come out of this cave today. This is Luke chapter 17 verses 11 through 14. <clears throat> Check this out. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And they went and they were cleansed. Now let's stop right there. Time out. Stay with me. We serve the God who is powerful enough. And I want to encourage you this morning, no matter what you're going through, no matter what feels hopeless, sickness, depression, PTSD, whatever you've been dealing with for days, weeks, years, decades, I came to tell you this morning that we serve the God who is powerful enough that he says a few words to people who've been lepers their entire life and instantly in this moment, go show yourselves to the, the priest. They're cleansed. That is the God that we serve this morning. Whatever you are needing this morning. <clears throat> See, we want the thunderbolts and the lightning and maybe God would never do it for me. One word from his mouth can change your life in here today. We serve the God of just a few words and you're cleansed. You know what, though? The hardest part of the human condition, though, is getting humans to step out and get out of the caves that they've lived in their whole lives. Humans, you know, we, we want relief, but we don't want to change. We want God to move in our situation, but only according to the way that we feel like He should move in our situation. This book from the beginning to the end, is constantly a loving God who is stretching as far as he can, saying, let me take control of your life. Let me love on you. Let me heal you, deliver you. And he is reaching. You ever seen the painting of, of, of Adam and God, the fingers touching? 
When we get that new church down there, it'll be me and Daryl touching. <laughs> Don't be freaked out. Have you ever noticed in that painting, God is full extension reaching for Adam, and Adam can just barely, I just, I just can't. That's the human condition. These men want to be healed of leprosy. They've been ostracized from society. Why? Because they are highly contagious. Leprosy was a death sentence. It was a horrible, painful death. Listen, if you thought the world lost their mind during COVID-19, leprosy was 100% more contagious than COVID-19. People had to live in caves. You had to be removed from society because you were an infection to society. And I can't help but imagine these men say, Jesus, have mercy on us. And he says, go show yourselves to the priests. And I'm wondering if any in this moment said, oh, man, we got to travel to go to the priests to be healed. My question this morning is when you need a breakthrough, when you need a healing, how bad do you want it? Because, listen... If I knew that, that there was a church in town that was healing people, was raising the dead, casting out demons, and I had a sick child, and I'd been to every doctor, and I'd been to every you know, clinical psychologist all around the country, if I heard about that, I am taking them because there is a blessing in being willing to travel and say, I will not take no for an answer. Sadly, the hardest thing, though, about ministry and being a pastor sometimes is I want change and breakthrough for people's lives more than they want it for themselves. And God's the same way. He wants to move in your situation. Can, uh, can I do a rant real quick? Because I want to talk about grace this morning. <laughs> Shocker, right? I thought Daryl just did such a fantastic job. The reason we're so in this vein of where God is leading us with grace is because we've come to the realization after years and years and years of preaching, you better get right with God, you better get right with God, the do's and the don'ts. We've realized that people still live any way that they want. In fact, they say, well, I can't even live up. I'm not going to come to church with all these perfect people. I can't live up to it, so why even try? That's why we're preaching on grace, because there's, uh, there's a God who loves you more than you could ever think or imagine and gave His Son as your sacrifice so that you don't have to live in that sin anymore and you can come home and be made whole and healthy and healed today just like these lepers in Jesus' name. That is what grace is. Well, Brian, if you say that, people are going to live in sin. People live in sin anyway. My, uh, listen, if my sermons have perfected your life to make you not live in sin, then I would have retired a long time ago. And listen, if you want to live in sin, you want to live in willful sin, it will ruin your life. God won't punish you. The sin will punish you. Well, Brian, what about people that live in sin? They're going to reap what they sow. But there's always the grace of God reaching out to them saying, you don't have to live in that cave anymore. You want to see what grace looks like? Luke 17, 15 through 19, continue with the story. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Another translation that I love, it says, your faith has made you whole. Amen. This is the picture of grace. The person that did not deserve healing, not only was he cleansed and he healed, but he ran back to Jesus in this moment, drops down on his knees and says, thank you, God. I'm not deserving, but I will worship you and I will praise you. Listen, I could do a whole series of sermons on the power of leper worship. You ever worshipped like a leper because things are going awry in your life? See, most people, they won't change in their life, but they're not willing to change anything in their life. I came to tell you, the worst seasons of my life, I have raised my hands, I have shouted, I have gotten on my knees, I have cried at the altar, and I have asked God and praised God and worshipped God because I knew that He was the only one that could move in my situation. The worse the situation, the louder you praise and worship. When the praise goes up, the power comes down. 
I love you guys. I really do. But when I'm up here and I'm crying and I'm worshiping and I'm raising my hands, there's no one else in this room. It's me and an audience of one. You want some things to change in your life? Start worshiping like you've never worshiped before and watch how everything's changed. And it's not because it impresses God. It's because it tells your flesh and the enemy that you can't be bought and that you're going to worship through that situation. <clears throat> I'm wondering how many people are honest with themselves today and they're like, boy, I, I'm at a place I need some leper worship to receive what God has for you. But see, this time, I, I've read this story a million times. This time, I see this story from a different angle. Yes, I got it that the one, he understood it, and it made him whole. My question is, I'm wondering how many of the ten, because only one came back, I'm wondering if the nine who were cleansed went back to cave life after this touch from God. I wonder if they went back to what was comfortable, what's, what they've known their whole lives. It's in their identity of who they are. It's what was comfortable for them. What I'm really wondering was, did they not come back to praise Jesus because they didn't feel worthy? What do you mean, Brian? I'm wondering if anyone in here today has ever been in a really great place with God. You ever been in a great place with God? You're at every time the church is open. You're tithing. You're praying with people. Nothing can steal your joy. You're down here in town and no one knows how to use the connector roads. And when you use them correctly, they give you the finger of fellowship and you say blessings to you, brother, who are highly favored and blessed. <laughs> Nothing gets you down. You ever been in that place with God? Man, I'm in a good season with God. And then when you're in that good season with God, did you ever mess up? Create a blunder, sin, make a mess of your life. See, God cleansed these ten people. And I'm just wondering, when I was reading this story, just, God started speaking to me, and he said, a lot of times people won't come to me because they think that I only have one miracle or one move for their life, and then they don't get any more. See, the shame of this world, the condemnation, the sin, it will keep you from coming to God. But God is the one. He wants you to come to Him first and foremost when you can't get yourself out of that cave. See, this one understood. I think he understood he didn't deserve it, and he wanted to go thank God and praise Him. But I also think he understood, Jesus, I don't want to go back to this cave life. I want to follow you, and you're the only one that can give me this new identity now. And I'm going to follow you and praise you all the days of my life. And it says he was made whole. <clears throat> see, the one guy got it. But see, I'm wondering if there's people in here, God has cleansed you. But then you've gone back to the caves that you've been familiar with in life. And now you feel like, well, I can't go stand before God now because I'm not worthy. That's why Jesus came to make us worthy. Some of you have gone back to your caves due to shame, condemnation, hurt, pain, can't get your act together. And what God has sent me here this morning, I don't know who this is for or maybe it's just for me. He sent me to pull you out of that cave and show you that Jesus has been at the entrance of that cave all your life holding out his hand and saying, you don't have to live here anymore. This is not your identity. I don't care what you did last night. I don't care how you messed up. That's not your identity. Let go of that sin. Come out of this cave and be made whole. But see, I talk to people all the time, especially Christians. Brian, I, I can't. This is who I am. This is who I am. Well, I keep going back to it. I'll never, I'll never be able to kick this. I'll never be able to overcome this. That is a lie. Come out of that cave. Yes. My favorite story in the Bible is Jesus speaks to the cave that Lazarus is buried in. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And then it, the rock rolls away, and here comes Lazarus, kind of in his mummy costume, you know, the, Y'all pray for me. I love that because Jesus was waiting right there as soon as he came out. I want to read you this story. This is Psalm 40, 1 through 3. This is someone who's made a mess of their life. Can anyone in here relate? Maybe it's just me. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit and out of the mud and the mire. 
And he set my feet on the rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth and a hymn of praise to our God. Can I tell you something? Do you understand when you read this verse what the miry mud and muck and and just the, the pit that he was in, do you know what that was? He had made a mess of his life. And guess what? When God touches you and cleanses you and you make another mess of your life, you don't have to go back to that cave because Jesus paid the price for you to not live in that cave anymore. Don't settle for the lies of the enemy of this is who you are. You're a cave dweller. That's what he will tell you. This cave is your master. This depression. This not feeling loved. This anxiety, this is the cave of life that you live in. And I came to tell you today, Jesus is waiting at the entrance and saying, you don't have to live down here anymore. This is not your address anymore. Come live with me. Come out of that cave of addiction, shame, lies, living in sin, not being enough. Hey, here's a big one I see in the church. People are just numb these days. How's your life going? Fine. How's your family? Fine. How's your job? Fine. Well, are, do you enjoy this about your life? It's fine. The devil will get you numb in this life to where you don't enjoy your life, you don't enjoy anything in this life. That's a cave. God came to give you life and life more abundant. Come out of the cave of depression, sickness, no purpose. You're barren. Whatever title has been put on you, Jesus is here this morning. Today is different. I know you've been living in that cave for 10, 20, 30 years. Can I tell you something? Today is the day of salvation. Today is different. Today is different. You've been living in that cave of you got this title or this title or this title. And what God is saying, you don't have to live there anymore. See, the one that came back, he understood how much he had been forgiven. But he said, I don't want to go back to this lifestyle. I don't want to live in that cave anymore. That's why he worshipped Jesus the way he did. He knew he wasn't worthy. He just received it. Some of you are trying to rub the lamp of God and get him to move in your situation by being good or trying to do this or reading your Bible. And those are all good things. Those are all fruits of the Spirit. He already wants to move in your situation. He loves you. He's waiting on you to come out of that cave. Don't settle for the lies of the enemy. He has a new address for you, and it's with him. I want to end with this. I'm wondering who who needs to walk out of some familiar caves today if we're being honest with ourselves. I know everybody in here, we're saved, blessed, and highly favored. Don't struggle with anything. The devil ain't got nothing on you, and you're great. I'm wondering if someone will be willing to to look on the inside and say that I'm not okay and that I do need a touch from God. So God's had me in this vein recently. It's it's been um it's been really interesting. Have you ever looked up the meaning of your name? There's good meanings to people's names, there's there's bad meanings. (laughs) Some people you look at them and you're like, man, they they're kind of wild, and then you read what their name means, and it means wild child, and you're like, they live up to that. <clears throat> so I remember many years ago uh, in school, uh, they had us look up our names, and I looked up Brian, and it meant strength and honor. It's Scotch-Irish. And I know, I know, <laughs> let me stop you. I know when you look at me, you think bodybuilding strength. I know, I know. And you think honor right off the bat. As much as I loved what my name meant, there's been so many times in my life I have felt like I have not lived up to a title like that. See, I've felt more in line with what the world has called me and what the things that I've struggled with or what the devil has told me that my name is. I've felt more in line with that's who I am. That's my name. Those were the caves that I lived in, and I kept going back to what the world and the enemy called me. And I'm just wondering if there's people in this room today that you keep answering to a name that God never gave you. You keep answering to a name that you think is your identity. You keep living in a cave that you think is your home and that you'll never be able to come out of. 
<clears throat> and Jesus is saying, today, today you don't have to live there anymore. You don't have to go by that name anymore. One of the most powerful stories in the Bible, Adam and Eve. They messed up. They missed it. They blew it. And Christians make me laugh. You ever hear, you're in a Christian crowd and you hear someone say, boy, I can't wait till we get to heaven. I'm going to give Adam and Eve peace of my mind for all this mess we've been in. I'm glad they failed the test before I failed it and got all of humanity into this. Well, I wouldn't have eaten that apple. Dude, the life I've lived, I've eaten the whole apple cart. We forget sometimes how much we've been forgiven. We forget sometimes how far God has brought us. Just God put it on my heart, these caves we live in and stuff, that we answer to these names that he never gave us. But what I love about the story of Adam and Eve, they missed it. They blew it. They were separated from God, and he comes running to them. And they say, we hid. We hid. They went back into their cave. They hid. Why? Shame. Guilt, condemnation. Number one reason I believe people are not in church right now is because they're ashamed of the way they've been living, where they were last night. They don't think God could ever love them. They don't think they measure up, and they'd rather stay in that cave because that's where they think they live. And God comes to them and says, Hey, I know, I know you missed it. I know you missed it. Why were you hiding? Well, we hid because we were afraid, and, and we, we saw that we didn't have clothes on, so we sewed this together, and that's shame. And in this moment, God says, who told you that was your name? God, who had every right to be angry, be like, what have you done? Comes to them and says, okay, okay, you messed up. Who told you you have to live in this case? Who told you that was your name? Your name is not divorce. Your name is not depression. Your name is not single mom. Your name is I am not loved. Your name is not widow. Your name is not no one sees me. Your name is not fill in the blank. God sent me today to say you don't have to live in that cave anymore. That's not your name. I know you struggle with that. It's not your name. Well, Brian, how can you say something like that? Because of what Jesus did at the cross. See, he was so covered up with Brian... That's when he was separated from God. He was covered up with my mess and your mess. See, he wants to pull you out of the miry pit, out of that cave, and set your feet on solid ground because that's the mess that you've made. Well, Brian, I can't clean up my mess. That's why Jesus came. But there's too many people. God sent me today. Your name is not cave dweller anymore. That is not your name. Sickness is not your name. Not being able to have children is not your name. Your family being broken, that's not your name. God says you are loved. You are accepted. Now come home. Come out of that cave. You don't have to live there anymore. I know that you've lived there for a long time and that it's comfortable. You don't have to live there anymore. Come out of that cave. Your name is love. Acceptance forgiven, leave that life of sin behind and come home. Let me get you a stand.